said, is, is that on your card, consulting detective? Uh, no, it just says detective. You need to add consulting, <laughs> I think. <laughs> Let's hear more about your experience. Give us a little more bio info. So I started in 1978, and at that point in my life, as you might remember, I'd had a few interactions with the police, mostly about my driving. <laughs> and, but one of the things that really kind of stuck in my mind was those interactions were usually not very positive, and they certainly didn't change my behavior. I kept driving like a moron. Um, so I, I saw an advertisement for a police officer, and I thought, well, I'm going to go see what that's all about. It was more on a whim than anything. I was kind of interested. I thought it's a really tough job. I'll go see if I can make a difference. And 300 and some people took the test, and they hired two of us. And so I started out, and when I got to the department, in very short order, they said, you know, you look really, really young. And I was the youngest officer they'd ever hired. And they said, how would you feel about working undercover? So I said, well, what does that mean? And they said, well, basically, we're just going to send you out, and you're going to buy drugs. And, find out what's going on in the world. So I did that for uh, actually two different departments for about 18 months. And one of the things that I did is I went back to school in high school. So, so I- wait, you're how old and you're I'm, back in I'm high 20, school? I'm, I'm about 22-ish, 23 when I ended, uh, 22 years old. So I make up my own transcript and show up at the local high school and enroll. And not only did they not check it, they just, oh good, another student, we must get another $10 a year for him. So. <laughs> It, it took, in that case, and, and, and drugs back in the late 1970s, 1980s, in fact, even today, you know, there's quite a bit of discussion about them, but certainly they were a focus of law enforcement. So I think within three days, I was buying cocaine as an as a enrolled high school student. And uh, when I went into high school, I worked in two different high schools for about five months, and I made 108 felony cases. And, you know, for those of you who go, oh, geez, you're picking on the poor kids. Uh, one of our rules was no marijuana, and all we want is chemicals. So I really focused on the periphery of the drug traffic uh, around schools, which was LSD, cocaine. Uh, there was no methamphetamine back then. We called it speed, and there was, but not much. So I went from there. And I changed departments, and I, I went to work uh, as a patrol officer. And I'll inject from my point of view. The next thing we see is he's on the front page of the Seattle Times <laughs> for this five-state-wide thing. We're like, oh, so that's where Mark's been. So, okay. And I wasn't really following what I wanted to do. I kind of wanted to make a difference in the world. I thought, you know, uh, I'm not, not really happy, and I was very much an ideologue, and I, I think I still am. And so I thought, well, maybe I can do some different things. So they started kind of moving me around. And I worked in traffic for a while and went to lots of fatal car crashes. And uh, in deference to uh, Jason, by the way, I didn't bring any dead body pictures. So, um, but so I, I did that. And I, I worked. And I was on SWAT for a while. And um, you know, I had a variety of assignments. I ran a marine patrol boat in Puget Sound for a while. And um, I was a firearms instructor and use of force instructor and, and kind of stayed with that. And then despite the way that I was willing to speak out and just say whatever I thought. They kept promoting me, and I ended up as a police chief. And uh, finally, that was the last straw because it was really more about politics than it was about doing anything else. And I thought, you know, after 31 years, I'm going to give this up. So I did, and I, we built a house in North Idaho, and I'm a proud Idahoan. And then I was stupid enough to answer my phone. And they wanted me to, <laughs> it, wasn't, it wasn't Steve. So I went back to work uh, first for the Colville Indian Reservation. And uh, the, fall, the phone call I got was from a friend of mine. Actually, um, he was the, the man that uh, arrested Gary Ridgway, the Green River Killer, who was, uh, had become the police chief at Colville, and that's Matt Haney. And he said, hey, I just became the chief up here, and I'm wondering if you come help me. We got a few corruption problems. And so I said, yeah, but I'm only coming for six months. And he said, that's all it's going to take. So I, I came there. I, I worked on that for a while. I retired again, I thought. Then my phone rang again. And again, I shouldn't have picked it up. But I did. And it was the Idaho State Police asking if I wanted to work on their Office of Professional Services with Peace Officer Standards and Training, which was decertifying cops that had gotten in trouble. And I did that for three and a half years. But frankly, it's kind of become a bored with that because they pretty much all deserved it with the exception of one guy. And it wasn't really all that challenging. Then my phone rang again while I was still working for, for Idaho. And it was a call that says, um, hey, we've got some cold case homicides here that we'd like you to help with and maybe come and take a look. And I said, well, how many you got? And they said, well, kind of five, but really three really good whodunits. And I said, yeah, count me in, because I just couldn't resist that. 
And so I went there and uh, we solved the first one uh, presented to the AUSA uh, within about six months. And it was, it was nine years old when we started. And, and um, one interesting thing you might not know if you want to talk to your federal legislators, but this is something we didn't know because I always worked in the state system. But there's always a statute of limitations for different crimes. And in almost every state, the statute of limitations, say, for homicide is one year. I mean, is forever. Um, you know, misdemeanors one year and then gross felonies, you know, three, sometimes up to ten if they're sex offenses. But in homicide cases, there is no statute of limitations. So we presented this entire case and we had seven witnesses and forensics and all kinds of other things. And this really poor 19-year-old boy got beaten to death while he was begging for his life and it was a really uh, horrific crime and we went to the the AUSA and they said man there's no doubt you got this but did you know the statute of limitations for second degree murder because they didn't start out they just started out to beat him didn't mean to kill him did you know the statute was five years and it's now been ten and we said what and they said the statute of limitations in federal court for second degree murder is five years now the statute of limitations for theft of art is 20. So that was kind of a revelation, unless it's premeditated murder and you can prove the premeditation phase. And I was a little discouraged by that. Um, but then we got a couple of others and one that um, I have enough, at this point, I have enough to arrest the perpetrators, but I don't quite have enough to convict them, but we're very close. And I can't really talk about that one as much. But as we were doing that, we got a phone call from the Yakima Nation. And I should add that I work in Indian country primarily because I get a retirement check from the state, and if I go back to work within the state and I'm employed by them, then my retirement check gets interrupted. It's kind of a comforting thing to have come in. So uh, the Yakima calls up and says, you know, we got a few problems down here. And we said, well, what do you mean? And they said, well, do you have anybody that could come and help with some cold case homicides? Because we've got 33 people either, you know, murdered or missing that we're going to try to clear up. And I thought, well, 33, that's a pretty big number. So I went down to Yakima for about seven months, formed a team, and uh, within 18 months, we had that number down to 16. So um, that's a pretty high success rate for cold case homicides. And they're really, really fascinating, but I kind of got my first um, taste of, of cold case homicides, and Steve mentioned it way back in 1985 when um, I was just a patrol officer, and I walked into the detective's office, and there's a, a file box about this tall. I said, what's that? And the detective said, ah, that's an old homicide. And I said, well, how old? And he said, I don't know. It's like 20 years. It was from 1963. And so I said, is anybody working on it? And he goes, no. So I thought, well, could I? And he goes, hey, you know, knock yourself out. Go, go work on this homicide. So I took this huge box and started going through everything. And what I found is that over this 22-year period, um, the murder weapon was missing, the fingerprints were missing. Um, I found out that uh, virtually every bit of evidence collected by the crime scene team had been somehow misappropriated or destroyed, which didn't make any sense because really you're not supposed to lose evidence in evidence rooms. And, and then I got to the passage where one of the investigators had written that while he was taking footprints that he cast the police chief's footprint and said, hey, how'd your footprint get over here? And the police chief said, uh, I don't know. And nobody Did he thought, say it like that, yeah, he man? literally laughed and said, I don't know. <laughs> and and the, uh, the, the detective had made a note, but hadn't even written a full report. He's just like, I just casted these things. And of course, this is back in the 60s, you know, pre computers and pre APHIS fingerprints and all these other things. So I started looking at this and I thought, that just doesn't make sense. You don't lose evidence and why wouldn't anybody think it was a police chief? And everybody really liked the guy. He was like, you know, show up for coffee and shake your hand. And he, everybody trusted him. And he was just a superb guy. So in that case, what I did is I thought, who didn't they talk to? And this happened in the middle of the night. It was a janitor in a bowling alley. So I said, well, who didn't they talk to? And I thought, who's out in the middle of the night? And I thought, newspaper delivery and taxi drivers. So now I had to find out who were the newspaper delivery people and taxi drivers from 22 years before. But I found them, and it took some time. And when I interviewed one of the taxi drivers, at first he didn't want to talk, and then he finally said, this is about Jimmy, isn't it? And I said, yeah. And he goes, I know who killed him. And I said, who? And he said, the police chief. And I said, how do you know that? And he said, I picked him up that night and brought him to work. And on the way, he said, 
I think I did a really stupid thing. This man's name was Russ, I can say his name now, not that it matters because virtually everybody's now deceased. But, and I said, well, what do you mean? He said, well, Jimmy told me that he had told the chief, I need some money and if you don't give it to me, I'm gonna tell people about our love affair. So in 1963, being a gay police chief was probably literally a death sentence and it was certainly a way that you were never gonna work again. So that night, later, Jimmy Smith is killed. He's, he's hit in the head with a hatchet multiple times. And, 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 so, and so he had told the cab driver, he had told I the think cab I'm driver. gonna get murdered. He said, I think he's gonna kill me. I'm really, really scared. And so after the murder, of course, the cab driver thought, huh, I'm not saying anything. I mean, this was the 1960s, remind you. So now, you know, we start looking at all these different statements, and I go talk to some more people, and it becomes really clear that, that this chief's pattern of behavior, among other things, is he'd get up in the middle of the night and go on patrol. Well, part of that patrol was his love affair and that he would have. And at this point in his career, he had retired, and he was now in prison as a pedophile. And he liked little boys, so there was kind of a nexus to this sexual conduct. So uh, with all the evidence that I did find in the witnesses, I went to the prosecutor in this case, and I said, hey, I want to go arrest the former police chief. And the prosecutor, a guy named Danny Clem, looked at it all, and he goes, man, who would have thought? I said, yeah, can I go arrest him now? And he said, no. And he said, the reason is um, he's got another 15 years or so to do in prison. He has cancer, he's not expected to live more than two years, and I'm not spending a million dollars worth of taxpayer dollars to prosecute this guy, he's gonna die anyway. And so, although that was a frustration, I was able to go to the family and tell the family, here's what happened to your son, and, and here's who killed him. And that's kinda why I'm in this business now, that's why when they called me and said cold case homicides, I said, I'll do that, because the relief of families when they find out what happened to people who are missing is more than palpable. And I used to think I was a tough guy. In fact, I used to joke, you know, hey, I could, you know, I could eat a puppy for breakfast if I was hungry. Just hand him to me and, you know, I'll kill him. And, and that was kind of, <laughs> that was kind of my attitude. It's like, hey, it's kind of all about me and I don't really care about anybody else. You never told yeah. me that way back <laughs> Just for but, the record. <laughs> <laughs> but. Having said that, um, I really had a taste for in investigating old homicides, and so when I started to get the opportunity to do these things and interact with the families, um, I started to realize, uh, number one, how important I think the, that that mission is, and number two, that I can cry with the best of them. So I've held you know, many parents while they cried when I told them what happened to their children, and, and that's not an easy task, but I think it's something that we need to do, and it really fits into my philosophy, and sorry I'm going on so long, but it, it fits into my philosophy that there's this big disconnect in the world, and I don't know about you, but I thought there was a disconnect between the police and everybody else in 1978 when I started, and I feel like it's a lot worse now. And so that's one of my personal passions is about treating people right, and I've been relatively successful, and I'm, I'm called to interview a whole bunch of different people. Well, you know, that, that's a nice lead into sort of this topic of... Um you know, what I've been saying is interrogation, but it's really, that's not, that's not the best word for it, is you're trying to solve, get a, get a puzzle solved. And um, I, what I was hoping to do today, which we will do today, is to impart to the audience a few of the techniques that you've used in your work that are relevant to, you know, some everyday, um, uh, you know, needs. Let's just talk about the one where the, uh, getting back to treating people right, how, uh, and building rapport, because that's part of what we're talking about, that the case you discussed where you got the confession, basically because you're a nice guy. <laughs> are, Talk about it. Or, are you know, we talking about the cop, the guy that killed the police officer? The one where you, you brought him water. <laughs> no, the one, isn't that? Well, that, I've done that a lot of times, um, but the, the cop killer was one that where I brought him Yeah, that's the one. Dinner, yeah, where that. I yeah, brought yeah, him that's dinner. That's a great one. So, I'm a young officer and, and, you know, we've been taught the, you know, the good cop, bad cop, you know, you go to the academy and it's like, you know, accuse them and do this and if they, you know, and I wasn't really ever comfortable with that role because that's really not who I am. I'm not a really accusatory kind of person. And so we get a call to a stop and rob, which we call like 7-Eleven, that's a stop and rob. 
and a neighbor calls in and says, hey, there's this guy been sitting in this car out front for like an hour. It just doesn't look right. So they send two cars, and, and my partner goes in and talks to the people inside, and I talk to the guy who's in the car, and I get his identification. Sorry, and this is kind of a long story, but it's an interesting one. So I run his name, and I get back. Dispatch calls me and says, hey, there's some kind of a warrant from California for this guy, but we don't know what it is. And I said, what does it say? And they said, and you California people will probably resonate with this quickly, but we don't have these penal codes like they do in California. They said, it's 187 PCPO. And I said, what is that? And they said, we don't know. And nobody gets on the radio and says, uh, that's murder. Well, 187 PCPO in the code is murder, probable cause of a police officer. And so here's a guy that isn't probably the nicest guy. So, you know, and I'm still, and I, I don't know this yet. So I'm going like, you know, hey, they're telling me there's a warrant for you. You kind of got to get out of the car. So he gets out, and, and we start to handcuff him. We find a, a Walther P38 9mm in his waistband, and then, you know, the stakes come up a little bit. <laughs> and so we get him arrested, and I, I take him down. We had a city jail, and we got there after dinner. So the first thing that was really curious to me is, like, this guy killed a police officer. If it's true, why didn't he try to shoot it out, sorry, with us? And so... It was after dinner, so I made him dinner, and I brought it into him, and I said, uh, hey, what's this deal about this warrant out of California? And he just looked me right in the eye and said, I killed a cop. And I was like, this can't be that easy. You can't get confessions. <laughs> and, and, and he said, yeah. He said he was going to arrest me. I didn't want to go to prison, so I killed him. He was lazy. And then I, the next question I asked him was, why didn't you shoot it out with me? Why didn't you try to kill me? And what his response was, he said, I could have killed your partner easy because he kept turning his back and, and he wasn't really paying attention. But every time I looked at you, you were watching my hands and your hand was on your gun. And he said, I thought the best I could do was a tie and I don't want to die. So. That's mindfulness. <laughs> Be in the now. <laughs> so I thought, well, this might be a good look from now on. For, um, so then what, the interesting part, so now that I, I've got a cop killer who's confessing to me and I'm taking all these notes and, you know, we didn't have tape recorders back then. I mean, they might have cost 12 or $15 and there wasn't money in the budget for that. And so I'm taking all these notes about, yeah, I killed a cop. And, and so he looks at me and he says, why do you guys wear those silver buttons? And I said, what do you mean? And we usually wore two silver buttons on our uniform pockets and then silver buttons going down because it was ceremonial dress. And we had silver buttons on our epaulets and our uniforms. And I said, well, I don't know. And he goes, you know, that's what they train us to shoot for is we shoot for the T. You know that, right? And I thought, oh. So within six months, we wore plastic buttons. <laughs> but that was my first indication that, you know, if you just go treat somebody decently, it's amazing what can come back. And I've really kind of built a career in interviewing. And, and I now interview not only as a homicide detective, but I'm the chief civil investigator for the 12 tribes in, in Colville. So I interview people from all different programs. And I teach interviewing as well. So that was kind of my first revelation that maybe not everybody's doing it the way it ought to be done. I think building, building rapport, right. um, you said, was you know, um, important. And let's get a little bit into the body language that um, you know, through these through these um, interviews, you've you've got an approach for for sensing where. Oh, I want to do my clip, don't I? So hey, hey, guys, do you have let's, my? Let's put our clip on. Do we want to do and that? And we'll go from there. Sorry. Well, let me first say. So when I started talking with with Mark, I, I, I anybody watch the show Luther? Anyway, I'm watching Luther. I go, wait a minute. That that reminds me of what Mark talks about. And so I I sent him the clip. It's two minutes. It's not long. I said. What do you think of this? Is it just baloney? It's TV, and you said? I said, well, it's actually not, and it's really good technique. Okay, good. Can we, would, would you guys mind showing that, uh, that Luther clip? Have you got it? You got audio? This was a very singular crime. No sign of robbery, and no apparent, and, and I'm sorry, sexual motivation. Now, I've been a police officer for a very long time, and one of the things that i found is that crimes like this aren't random. They're never without motive. So as painful as this is, I'm going to ask you to dig deep and really think about any money issues your parents may have been experiencing, any marital 
difficulties. I've done nothing but think. All I do is think. There's nothing. It's absolutely nothing. What time? So I'm absolutely clear. So nothing or anyone unusual. Sorry. I wish I could tell you I had. I'm so sorry. Oh, it's been a long day. Really, it's fine. It's very tiring going round and round like this. Must be exhausted. Can I get you a coffee? Tea. That'd be nice. And she did. She's very bad. <laughs> um, so let's talk a little bit about the, the body English. The, 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 we talked about a lot. I promised them a lie detection technique. That's okay. not, uh, I mean, first touch on that a little bit. What did you see there that you go, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's well, the, f the first thing is, and the first rule of interviewing is, to interview somebody, you have to have a conversation. So if you get, I'm not talking to you, I want a lawyer, you've pretty much shot down any potential for that. But once you get kind of by that, and in 37 years, by the way, I have never had a confession thrown out in court, so, which is not a, too bad of a record. But So what you see, first of all, is he's attending to her needs. He's, he's empathizing, he's building rapport, he's saying, I know you're tired, and all of those are really solid principles. And then he's watching her body language. You know, and you notice in, in this particular case, she's, that actress is playing the part pretty well, that she's just very sitting, sitting very straight and, and trying to give very clipped and measured answers. And that's the part of the interview where I would start saying, okay, something's not right here because I don't start out saying, I know you did it. Um, and so, and, and I, by the way, I would never take to a judge for a warrant saying, I yawned and they didn't, so I need, you know, to arrest them. Um, so that's the part where it sort of fails a little bit on the probable cause part. But, but the interaction and attending to the needs and can I get you a tea and all of those things, those, and if you see her visibly relax a little bit, it's like, okay, this part's over. I, I'm not being grilled or questioned anymore. Um, that's really indicative of somebody's, okay, they were really, really tense before, and it's understandable that they're with the police, but now they've relaxed a little bit. And the goal is to keep them relaxed, because when they start to get tensed up as you ask questions, that's, one of, that's a huge predictor of deception, that why did you get so nervous when I asked about this? And I interviewed uh, a serial killer at Walla Walla Prison uh, just before Thanksgiving this year. And we kind of went round and round. And he talked to me for 45 minutes and then asked if I'd come back and interview him again, and, which never happens. I mean, you're, you're in Walla Walla for murder. You don't want to be talking about other murders. But just because I took an interest in him and asked about how his family was and things like that, he started wanting to talk. And he gave us a number of bits of information that we had no idea were there. But as I was interviewing him or as I'm interviewing anybody, it's really critical to watch when people start to sit back. That's one of the, okay, we're losing the conversation. They're about to shut down. So the idea is to keep them talking. And you've probably heard like the old eye contact thing where you ask somebody what color their first car was. Yeah, that, just run with that. But they should, let's go through that. I'm, the I'm eye guessing. contact thing? Yeah, the whole yeah. The, 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 the detection approach. Because I'd never heard of that before. So for instance, uh, one of the techniques that's taught when you're interviewing somebody is you ask them a question that is completely not guilt-seeking and non-threatening, like what was the color of your first car? And if they've been around a while, they have to think about that for a second. And typically, their eyes will either go up and right or up and left just momentarily while they retrieve that information out of their brain. And then they'll come back and say, well, it was purple. You say, okay. And then later on, you'll get into a guilt-seeking question. 
did you kill your husband or did you hurt your husband? And if they look the other way or they don't do that searching thing and they just blurt an answer out, either they're ready for the question or you know they're lying at that point, they didn't have to think about that. So that's one of the, and that's been written up before, but that's one of the guilt techniques. Uh, the other thing is, for instance, when I interviewed... Do you, do you use that in real life? Absolutely. Okay. And Absolutely. Right, you're buying a used car. Information is symmetry. <laughs> you, and, and I ask you if you know the history of it. And you say, oh, yeah. But it didn't take him any time to think about, does he really know the history of that? So I know that he didn't go search for that information that either he does or he doesn't. You know, he gave me an immediate answer. He didn't have to think about it. So now I'm thinking, all right, either he really knows or he just lied to me. So now we explore, so tell me what you know about it. And so that's kind of a way to discern truth. And it's not that there is any singular approach, but one of the biggest things that I do after an interview, and my interviews will typically last an hour, and when I'm over maybe a 30-second event. And so when I'm done with that, we do a written transcript, and then I'll go back and look for inconsistencies and go, okay, this is not making sense here. Um, I told Steve I interviewed a, a murder suspect uh, not very long ago who's a woman and and nobody would think outside the box like there's no way it, it's her sister who's the victim and and she clearly killed her sister or was involved in the killing there's a co-conspirator there but nobody wanted to believe it because women just don't kill anybody and they certainly don't kill their own sister right so in the middle of this interview which is an hour long she kind of looks down really quietly and she says i need to be punished and, and we call that a clue and <laughs> And so we just kind of kept going. And so I, I got to the end of where I was ready to interview her, and I said, so where do you think we're going from here? And she put her hands up to have this handcuff her. The problem was, if I do that, I have enough to arrest her at this point, and, I, and she knows that. But if I arrest her, the speedy trial rule starts on the clock, and so I only have so much time to bring the case in, and I've got DNA waiting, and I have some other things that need to be done first. But she was ready although she wouldn't actually say she did it. And here's the reason. This is bad interviewing technique. And this is when uh, we have a rule called silence is golden, or he who speaks first loses. So when I said, where do you think we should go from here? And she puts her hands out. About two minutes goes by, and she's just sitting there looking at me. And another minute goes by, and the guy that's in the room, and the only reason he's in the room with me as a co-interviewer is to, one, be a witness in case something happens to me so he can validate the tape, and also because he went to high school with her. And so she trusts him. And so right in the middle of this, she's got her hands out, and he says, I don't really think you killed your sister. She went, ah. She literally let out a sigh, relaxed, and put her hands down. And so I was like, okay, if I could shoot you right now, at least in the knee, that would be good because I want to clear this case. And but if he was a puppy, if, I might have just eaten him. Just eat yeah. <laughs> so, so, That's what I'd do. So that's an example of, you know, silence is golden, and that's a, a very typical technique that I use is I just stop talking because humans like to fill that space. Um, so, <laughs> <laughs> um, let's briefly touch upon, um, you've got on our list we have uh, confidential informants. Okay, so um, let me tell you about confidential informants because they're a really integral part of, of law enforcement. You see them on all the police shows, although I don't watch too much. Um, but I developed a technique for con confidential informants, and I'm going to let a big secret out here of mine. Uh, so I was the kind of guy that would find somebody who was intoxicated under the influence and, and stop and talk to them because I'd arrested them before and say, hey, uh, are you still in AA? And they go, no. Well, when's the last time you went to a meeting? Well, I don't know, it's been a year. Well, how about if I take you to a meeting? So I would load these guys up in my car and take them to an AA meeting, and I always knew where they were. And, and so I would take people to AA meetings. And after the shock that a uniformed police officer is walking in, um, they all are involved in something called the 12-step program, for those of you that aren't AA. And one of the 12 steps is making amends. So although I took nothing out of the hall, it was unbelievable how many people would follow me out and say, hey, I need to talk to you about something. <laughs> And I ended up with more confidential informants than anybody that just wanted to do the right thing and, and tell me about bad things that were going on. In fact, I had one that was so good when they'd tell me he's on the phone, I'd just look at everybody and go, saddle up, boys, we're going on a warrant. <laughs> and, and so, but that's, that's one way that most people don't think of. You know, it's not the twist and turn, and if you don't do this, you're going to prison. 
it was far more the um, I'll help you if you want to help yourself. And, and that's much more my approach. Awesome. Well, we are right on time. So, very good. Closing thought? Yeah, do it. So one of the things, and I just want to leave this because it's a, a unique group and nobody really wants to think about being murdered. And uh, I had dinner last night with uh, a person that was robbed at gunpoint. And I said, when did you know that it was bad? And the description was when the robber was about eight feet away. And I hear this constantly from people. And so what I, uh, I tell you is when it's that close, it's too late. And so just collectively as a group, I would ask you to do a couple of things. Pay attention to your surroundings because nobody wants to be the victim of violent crime. And, and the other thing is keep doing what you're doing when it comes to engaging your local police. I, I'm very disappointed with a lot of the police uh, chiefs across this country who I feel are not engaging out of fear but, you know, it's just simpler to just not say anything and just send their cops out, and whatever happens, they just kind of blame it on them. And I was a police chief, and um, so keep doing what you're doing when it comes to asking for social change because I think the old way of doing things, you know, we have a whole lot of technology now that we didn't have, and, and the old way isn't so good. And I, I very firmly believe that about law enforcement and policing in America today, that we have a long ways to go to make it better.